OK, why don't, why don't I uh, begin? So I, I'd like to start by uh, thanking the uh, organizers, uh, Eric Sharp, uh, Ron Danaghi, uh, the rest of you, for uh, initiating what I think will be an important uh, series of uh, meetings and uh, setting a, a high bar for us to uh, follow in terms of the uh, quality of the organization, the quality of the talks. And uh, it's also, I think, uh, symbolic in the uh, representing the coming of age of this uh, subcommunity of uh, string uh, math. And uh, so it's interesting to see, you know, d you know in some sense we're at least uh, mapping out uh, some boundaries of, of what this field consists of. And uh, so I chose a talk to try to expand the boundary in another direction, which uh, is uh, represented. I know Kevin Costello is speaking about uh, these types of questions, but uh, not many others. And uh, I'll try to explain why I think this is a appropriate uh, topic for all of us to uh, consider. So, uh, okay. So, you know, obviously, you know, there's a question which uh, certainly belongs in a formal physics uh, math uh, interface. How can we uh, make mathematically precise definitions of quantum field theory and string theory? <coughs> and uh, it's not a new question, and many people have been working on it since before string theory. and. Uh, before much of what we now know about quantum field theory. <coughs> and uh, there's a variety of approaches. And uh, it would be hard to uh, survey them all in one talk. I'm going to just concentrate on a couple of things, such as uh, conformal field theory, which I've worked on, constructive quantum field theory as one of the more established ones. But of course, the you know, first point to make is that it's you know, fascinating from any point of view that, that you can have so many points of view on uh, one subject that uh, they come at it from different ways. So uh, the goals of the talk, well, you know, examine that question, you know, what, what is mathematical precision? I'm a physicist. What, 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 what do I have to, you know, why am I interested in talking about mathematical precision? Well, I think there are questions that we as physicists are, are kind of stuck on because we have not gone very far in that direction. There are questions which, again, barely existed back when you know, this field was uh, more popular, say, back in the 70s. And now that we know more about quantum field theory, we can, we can come back and try to, uh, you know, we, again, we ask these questions and we realize that those issues, which I'll explain, are relevant to them. OK, so just a very brief, uh, you know, let's recall, you know, we, we, you know some, some of us are mathematicians, some of us are physicists. We're, studying this, this common field, this interface. And uh, nevertheless, we, we, we see ourselves as at least two, two parts of this subcommunity, and in, in most uh, respects, two members of two different communities. And uh, how, how did that come about? Certainly wasn't always true. And uh, you know, of course, a very basic comment is that back in the uh, you know, 18th century, say, the community was incredibly tiny, and one person could hope to follow all of it. And uh, that's certainly no longer true. And if you look at the history, it, it really changed uh, over 100 years ago. And uh, already then, it was hard for one person to follow all the important developments in this broad area of uh, physics, mathematics, dot, dot, dot. And uh, then, of course, there are much more specific developments you can point at, which both require you know, a good deal of uh, training and thought to really appreciate, and which tend to bring people in a certain direction, perhaps at the expense of other directions. And uh, so obviously, the development of mathematical rigor in this period of the mid to late 19th century is key development in, in mathematics. And uh, as a physicist, you know, well, I, I, you know, some of my teachers were mathematicians who followed this, and some of them did not. And uh, for whatever reason, I didn't myself internalize all of this. So uh, that's a concrete example, which I'm sure many of you can uh, sympathize. OK, so then why is, is mathematical rigor at all good? Well, I'll come back to that. But uh, it goes along hand in hand with this acceptance of uh, non-constructive methods to say that uh, you can prove that something exists 
in principle without even saying anything about how you would ever find that thing that you prove exists. And of course, that's an extreme case. But uh, definitely, we're all used to this type of argument. And uh, once you, you know, regard this as, as important or as good as a, a constructive technique, this again changes your point of view. And you have to be much more confident now in the quality of your arguments, you know, since, since you don't have the actual object at hand that you're proving exists. And uh, then, then conversely, there, there really are many <coughs> examples I don't want to list of techniques which were developed really much more for the purposes of physics, engineering, dot, 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 which uh, don't have quite the same appeal to mathematicians. And uh, you may see, we may, well, we can decide as we go through the talk to what extent things I'm talking about fall into that category. But, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a real thing, which uh, you know, means that this is inevitable, this, this I think, uh, division into two communities. And then we, as the string math community, should keep that in mind. So of course, uh, this, this trend uh, grew over the years. And there are these famous quotes from the uh, sort of most, you know, the dark age of math physics interaction. This is one of my favorites that uh, I read as a grad <laughs> student. <laughs> and uh, then this is another very famous one by uh, Freeman Dyson in a uh, address uh, to the AMS, where he, in fact, goes on to uh, propose uh, you know, constructing you know, or, or showing mathematically that quantum field theories exist as an important problem. And uh, <laughs> so, well, yeah, there, there things have improved since then. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so we uh, have a number, you know, because string math is also you know, not at all unique in being some type of mathematical physics in which mathematicians and physicists study common structures and uh, have overcome the language barriers and the, the sociological barriers and, and the various of these more superficial barriers and can you know, start to look at, well, you know, here are these two groups of people with somewhat different training talking and writing about the same thing. And it's always uh, interesting to look at you know, an actual pair of papers about the same thing. And uh, I've, again, one could probably give a whole talk about this. But uh, you know, as, as you all have experienced, you know, the math paper was a very specific mathematical style which evolved over the years, which has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, precision, definition, theorem, proof and in terms of explication and that a, a very you know, typical math paper will explain in the first session what it is they are working on, what problem they claim to solve, you know, the rough overview of how they do it, and then get into the details. Whereas uh, the, the typical physics paper, as you all know, will say, well, you know, back in uh, 1987, famous person X proposed this, and then there was this and that development references one through 100, and now we're working on this part of it. And uh, <coughs> then that has its own value, but it's not really as clear to the outsider. And uh, it then goes on, again, to be, uh, in this term I've heard from mathematicians, discursive, and uh, tell the story about uh, here are these different examples we can work out in physics. You know, we go one, two, three, infinity. And uh, then infinity is this very interesting conjecture, which often in our subfield turns out to be correct. So, so that obviously there's value to that. So uh, OK, so I certainly can't really criticize that. But there is this other approach of trying to make physical definitions and claims rigorous. And uh, of course, this is the traditional definition of mathematical precision. You know, people do prove theorems. They get them published in math journals. You know, they get jobs based on this and so forth. And uh, again, not something one can really criticize. But as a physicist, I'm going to not actually emphasize that point of it. Okay, and in fact, you can hear a number of mathematicians say that, in fact, that doubt that that's a goal. That's not the central goal. That's not how they would. You know, define mathematics, and uh, rather they would say that you know there are these structures out there, you know, perhaps created by us, perhaps platonic. But in any case, the uh, purpose of the mathematician is to understand these structures, to communicate this understanding, and you know the uh, proof is uh, only one, and perhaps not the most important element in that. And you know, a number of people, such as uh, Thurston, have written 
eloquent with making on that point of view. So, uh, okay, so, so having right from the start just said, well, I want these, you know, I, 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 I'm going to talk about these rigorous foundations, but I'm not actually going to care that much whether they're rigorous. You, you, may, you may think uh, that this is a, you know, again, futile exercise. But uh, I, again, there's a, there's a point I'm trying to get across and, and understand, and so let's continue. So, so we certainly have, you know, so what are foundations? Again, it's a, it's a, it's a word I'm not going to try to uh, define or explain in great detail, but we tend to know foundations when we see them, and they are the things that appear in textbooks when they're very well developed, and, uh, you know, then there are many such topics in uh, quantum field theory already. You know, certainly the, all the textbooks emphasize perturbation theory around free fields, perturbative renormalization theory. This is really the heart of the subject. Uh, there are axiomatic statements saying what we mean by a quantum field theory, what, what properties it really should have to be counted as a quantum field theory. That's really foundational. There's a huge amount of structure in respecting symmetries, gauge invariance, you know, more subtle aspects of the theory. And, and, and these are all foundational. And uh, it's, it's no coincidence that uh, you know, there has been rigorous work done on all of these topics. And uh, so there are other foundational topics which I'll get to. Now, again, you know, one could do these things rigorously or not, and it might or might not uh, help somebody understand. You know, it might help a mathematician understand because he, he's used to that. You know, it might help a physicist understand it for other reasons. But again, the, the, the mathematical treatments tend to emphasize slightly different points and to ask questions that often either don't occur to the physicist or are just treated you know, very superficially in a page. And so, for example, you know, one, one you know, well-known question here is, you know, what, what does the choice of field variables you know, in a functional integral or some other formulation mean? You know, surely it's not a fundamental aspect of the theory, and you can make field redefinitions, take fields which are function, local functionals of the fields you started with, and in some way get the same theory. And that's certainly discussed in physics treatments, and one has uh, LSD theorems regarding the S matrix and other sorts of uh, theorems about field redefinitions. But uh, it's just a, it's, it's sort of a side point. It's, it's, it's something you should keep in mind. Whereas some of the mathematical treatments make this really very central to say that, well, you know, this is geometry. You know, the whole point of geometry is that the coordinates are not the central conceptual thing. They're just a tool to use to describe this uh, structure, which somehow could exist without coordinates, even though we have to use coordinates to work with it. And so that's certainly a very different point of view than just, uh, you know, here are fieldy definitions. You know, let's, let's talk about them for a page. And uh, there's something to learn from that point of view, especially as a string theorist. Okay, again, you know, another obvious point. Uh, how does one deal with these infinite number of degrees of freedom? You know, we all have to cope with this. And there are a lot of mathematical tools which can be useful both in terms of proving and in terms of making the points clear. Okay, now of course there, there are many topics for which uh, the community to some extent started out closer together. The physicists started out talking to the mathematicians. They're really pretty good already from any point of view I'm talking about here. And many of the topics we discuss in these conferences are like that, you know, certainly uh, solid times, instant times, you know, especially things that you really can formulate either classically or in terms of uh, one loop quantum physics, you know, these are things with good mathematical foundations and there's not that same level of difficulty. So it's not a universal problem, but there are various foundational topics which I as a physicist would like to be able to call on, which aren't as well developed in my opinion as, as what I discussed. And so uh, one very basic example, I'll say more about what I mean by all these things, is that uh, there's a, a, a huge you know, discussion, thousands of papers, you know, many textbooks on perturbation theory around the uh, free field theory, you know, the free boson, the free fermion. And there's very little about uh, perturbation theory around other solvable models, conformal field theories, or models that you might imagine solving other ways. And uh, this would be a very valuable tool. And uh, in some ways it's similar, but it's obviously, you know, for, for reasons that I'll get to you know, more complicated. And it's not that there aren't papers. You know, you know, very, you know, periodically, every year, one can see maybe 
10 or 20 papers on this subject. The problem is that none of them really quite gets to the bottom of it. Nobody developed a formalism that you, you, know, you can go out to all orders and so forth. And uh, so that's a foundational topic which, uh, you know, again, it, 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 it's out there. It deserves to be developed. It, it, I, I don't think a very good job was done yet. Uh, exact normalization group is another of these. Uh, the conformal bootstrap, again, I'll, I'll talk more about it. You know, very good in you know, two dimensions, C less than one, not terribly well developed. And you know, there's a few other cases. But, but again, this, this is something foundational which we ought to understand better. Uh, large and there's a lot of foundational work on large and this is a better this is actually one of the ones I could have put on the previous transparency because there's a lot of good work both by mathematicians and physicists here but uh, not not really in, in textbooks interestingly enough and, and then the other comment to make about it is that I think a lot of what one sees in ADS CFT either you know it's, it's some fusion of large and normalization group obviously and, and so we in principle, know much more about this topic than we knew 10 years ago, which hasn't been reflected in this old foundational work. So I'm not, not going to talk much about this one here, but it's, I think it's another good one. OK, so now, so now let me get to uh, the kind of questions that I think, uh, you know, why, why do I throw those things out as things that I would like to uh, have? OK, so of course, the traditional question of this field is that we have these uh, physics methods, physics results. You know, mathematicians would like to use them. Even physicists would like to have certain things uh, solidly uh, proven. I, I had this, uh, when I was you know, beginning graduate school at Caltech, I had this brief you know, number of discussions with Feynman, but in particular about the subject of uh, you know, theorems and, and rigorous work in quantum field theory. And of course, as you would imagine, he thought this was all crap and that uh, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing any good had ever, any good had ever come out of it. And uh, then I asked him about the uh, CPT theorem. And he immediately, well, you know, one, one good thing. That was the only thing. <laughs> 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 so it, it is the existence, you know, th theorem to show that, that good things can come out of this, if even Feynman agrees. And uh, so th again, there's a lot of things you could look at. But I think for the audience here in our subfield, by far the uh, outstanding problem would be to take these many localization computations that we have in supersymmetric field theories, you know, two-dimensional, topological, open, closed string, you know, cyborg witten you know, the, uh, you know, many newer calculations in, in three dimensions, four dimensions. And, you know, they, on some level, you know, even some of these are, are rigorous and mathematicians write such, pa such papers, but I don't think anybody has ever written a paper starting from an actual definition of the supersymmetric field theory in question as a supersymmetric field theory, not a topological theory or something else, and showing that this is actually the answer for what we call a you know, protected or topological quantity in that theory, and not just sort of taking a huge shortcut in the middle and saying, well, you know, because it's supersymmetric, we only need the supersymmetric configurations. So that's surely true, but it deserves proof. And uh, if you had a proof, well, you know, proof number one, you'd have to define these theories. So even that's not out there. So I can confidently say that this hasn't been rigorously justified. But once you have the definition, then you can see, well, in this big integral over field space or whatever other formulation you make of the theory, here is where the supersymmetric guys sit. Here is where all the rest of the stuff is. You know, at least implicitly, there's some sense in which it's all canceling out or we're deforming the contour of integral integration or doing something to justify this localization. And uh, again, it's not that far. You know, there are certainly many finite dimensional. There's 2D Yang Mills. There, there's, there's actually work by uh, Chris Woodward and collaborators doing this kind of thing. It's not super symmetric, but of course it lo you know, localizes. And uh, this, this, to my mind, is a outstanding goal that this would show that, you know, well, yes, at least we know what quantum field theory is. We can make contact with these results that we find so interesting now. OK, so that's an example of a question. OK, another, another class of questions. Uh, well, there are many approaches to non-perturbative QFT, both you know, physically and mathematically. And uh, often they involve taking limits of sending a cutoff to 0, to, la to you know, your lattice spacing to 0, say. You know, we truncate the sunset of modes and then consider more and more modes. And then, of course, one always you know, says, well, you know, as I take my cutoff you know, to you know, infinity or my lattice spacing to zero, this converges to the uh, theory I'm trying to define. And then 
you know, sometimes, especially in lattice, that make community people make more precise statements and say, well, you know, we, we, we see correction governed by this irrelevant operator, and it vanishes at this power of epsilon and so forth. And uh, then it, it, it kind of stops there. And uh, there isn't really a more precise theory that's developed. And, and then you compare this to you know, analogous topics where there is a mathematical theory like uh, PDE, numerical analysis, you know, a, a variety of, of so things. Is yeah. the program of constructors here? I'm getting to it. That's oh, right. Okay. I mean Except that, that, that paragraph but is I'm sort of a description of what well, they're going to do. Well, yes and no, because the, 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 the next slide is going to be something that they didn't do. So uh, <laughs> anyways, that's right. So, so definitely this is a mathematical kind of preoccupation, but a very useful one to, uh, to, to have in mind and to be able to state these claims more precisely. And for, you know, say, PDE, it's, it's been done. It's very central in the theory. And uh, how does one do it? Well, again, it's, it's a, not a huge story, but uh, it would use up a good fraction of my talk. But a very, you know, basic foundational ingredient would be to say that we define norms on spaces of functions, you know, so we could have L2 norm or LP norm, and use those to define distances between functions. And then there's a lot of these definitions, if you, as you'll know if you've looked at math textbooks. And uh, then, at least this is giving you a language to state these results, to say that uh, I've approximated the function by choosing a, you know, its values on the lattice. And uh, it's true that as the lattice spacing goes to zero, that converges to the function, but only in, in the sense that you know, these particular distances or these particular derived quantities converge, and then you can decide, well, you know, for what I want to do, what kind of convergence do I actually need? And uh, so that's a very useful tool for a thought, which is, you know, very normally part of the mathematical discussion. And uh, so here, you would like to talk about uh, distances between quantum field theories in the same way. So uh, if we're going to claim that we're approximating a quantum field theory, well, then we'd like to have some precise definition. Well, how close is it to the quantum field theory? And uh, then depending on you know, what class of theories you're looking at, you could do that in different ways. So the renormalization group is a case where this is actually kind of standard. So uh, you're all familiar with uh, renormalization group flow equations and the concepts, you know, the critical surface, relevant and irrelevant operators. And so one would like to formalize that by saying, well, here's a norm on the space of actions. Here's a distance between a pair of actions. Uh, if it's in a relevant direction, then the distance decreases under the flow. And then the, the better RG papers do this, starting even with uh, Polchinski. So even physicists find themselves uh, you know, brought into this, this mode of thinking once the question becomes precise enough. And then this is a, a standard part of that discussion, but not in generality, just in this case where you have an action, you have the RG, you're working by perturbation theory around the uh, Gaussian fixed point. There really isn't any definition or any accepted definition of distances between quantum field <coughs> theories constructed in any other way. And so although you're right, Jacques, that this is something that the constructive theorists implicitly talk about in their, in their papers and books, it's not something they actually systematized. And it, it, would, it would be useful to do that. And uh, so I'm working on a, a project of this sort. This is coming out of the paper I wrote last May. But uh, you know, again, it's, 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 you know, this is just you know, one approach. And this is a very you know, foundational aspect of the discussion, which again is kind of missing to, to my mind and would be useful for me and I think for other physicists as well. OK, so, so then another <coughs> clear sort of, you know, foundational aspect is that if you're going to show that something does not exist, then obviously you have to have a, a, a good definition of some ability to work with, uh, you know, the defining concepts and, and you know, the attributes of the thing you're trying to prove don't exist. And uh, so one standard claim in this area, you know, what's the simplest one? Well, there's no interacting bosonic field theory in greater or even four dimensions. Okay, so that's a certainly something which was proven in some sense, by the uh, constructive field theorist. There's a well-cited theorem of uh, Eisenman. And it's, 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 of course, a correct rigorous theorem as in, within the assumptions he stated. So the continuum limits of Euclidean 5-4 lattice fields, where the action has the kinetic term of 5-4, are free fields in these, in these dimensions. And it's a fairly short and illuminating proof. But of course, it doesn't prove there's no such theory. It just proves that that way 
of trying to define an interacting bosonic theory doesn't work. And uh, then, of course, if you drop unitarity and you just ask for statistical models, there's, there's lots of theories in arbitrary dimensions. You, know, you can have uh, higher derivatives and whatever you want. And uh, they just won't be unitary. And uh, so once the arguments start to rely on sufficiently subtle constraints, is, you know, of course, you can't you know, be sure until you have a proof that you really know what's going on. And uh, so all that was kind of abstract. But now that we actually believe that there are interacting field theories in six dimensions, you know, the two-zero theory and the one-zero theory and so forth, well, you know, this now, now all bets are off there. And uh, so you can try to cook something up using that, basically by flowing, perturbing, and so forth to get rid of the other variables. So you might take the one-zero theory, which is the N5 brain near the Horshava Witten boundary. So super Yang Mills theory with matter, but now in this higher dimension. You know, it's no longer super Yang Mills, it has a tensor multiplet and so forth. But it in some sense, you know, it's it's the you know primordial six-dimensional theory from which this comes. And now you can try to go out on its Higgs branch and uh, break all the gauge symmetry. You can can't add fermion masses in six dimensions because they are chiral, but as soon as you go down to five dimensions, you can add fermion masses. You can couple to the R symmetry current and add an auxiliary field and so forth. And you can get a bosonic theory, an interacting bosonic theory in the IR, describes modulized spaces of E8 instantons. And that's in five and possibly six. You know, possibly you can even do better in getting rid of the fermions in six. So, so was this the, the counterexample to your original question? It depends what you mean by boson it. You know, so definitely at low energy, this has got this boson, so you've embedded a UV completion, but uh, of course, you know, it's got all this UV stuff, and it, you know, the action, you know, the, the action is really not uh, positive. It's not integral of a positive quantity, you know, so it certainly doesn't uh, evade this theorem of Eisenman specifically, but it's, it's sort of an in-between case. You know, there are things to say about these theories in higher dimensions. Okay, and then uh, let me go quickly over this one because I've given talks about it. So once you can show that some quantum field theory doesn't exist. Then you can start talking, making general statements about the space of the ones that do. It's, it's really, there, there are good reasons to think you'll never classify it except for special cases, but that's obviously an important question. What can you say about it? One important uh, and, 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 you know, well studied goal is to define the central charge in every dimension where, which decreases under RG flow. Once you have that type of measure of the number of degrees of freedom, you like some sort of statement that the set of the conformal field theories with uh, that central charge from below is finite in some sense. And the right way to say that is it's pre-compact and you have to put a lower bound on the operator dimensions. And this has been discussed in my other work. And then once you have such a well-defined set in your hands, you know, what, what class of construction suffices to, to make it? So at least in two dimensions, you can't prove, there's no, there's no clear argument that you can't do them all by linear sigma models, gauge linear sigma models of various types. I don't know that's the case, but it's a still at this point a valid, you know, a plausible conjecture. OK, so, so those were questions. Now let me quickly survey some of these approaches. And of course, the first thing that we would go through if I were trying to you know, spell all this out is that different approaches talk about different data. You know, they might talk about correlation functions. They might just construct operators. They might uh, talk about the uh, S matrix. Uh, once you have these things, again, defined precisely, there's a lot of math you can call on that, that really helps you out. And, and, and in fact, the relation certainly between the, the first and the third in this uh, constructive field theory literature is, is almost trivial in the sense that uh, you, you, know, you, you put the right axioms. I'll, I'll, I'll skip ahead. I'm not going to list the axioms. But if you put the, the right axioms on the data, so these are appropriate axioms for correlation functions with certain growth or regularity conditions, these are appropriate axioms for this uh, operator Hilbert space uh, formulation. And uh, once you have them, there's, there's sort of you know, simple universal constructions where you can take all the correlation functions and get an operator algebra and representation that actually realizes that, you know, and, and vice versa. Since you've said the properties that the things have to have in order to make those relations work. And so that's part of the, uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's you know, certainly real content in this you know, axiomatic quantum field theory beyond the CPT theorem. Of course, it's not observable content, but it certainly 
com you know, shows that, that these are equivalent ways of talking about the same thing. But then there are many other ways of talking about the same thing developed since this time, which are, you know, we, we don't have these equivalence theorems, such as uh, conformal field theory, the BPZ, you know, the three point, you know, the OPE coefficients and operator dimensions. We, again, you know, we know, you know, BPZ told us that determines a two dimensional conformal field theory. In principle, in arbitrary dimensions, that's true. Can you prove, you know, that it really determines this other data? You know, that, that would certainly be worth knowing. You know, if you have all the partition functions and all genus surfaces, you know, can you prove that determines the rest? Well, again, you know, so, okay, so, so, so then, <coughs> Well, these explicit or rigorous approaches, certainly the explicit construction in terms of some explicit operator algebra is, you know, the ideal case. And, uh, well, the free field theory, you know, is, is one where you can certainly do that. And, uh, you know, one tends to, you know, you know familiarity, you know, breeds contempt. But uh, there are still good questions about free theory, especially if you put it in a curved background. You know, questions about how modular invariance works on the torus how different, you know, how, how this responds to the metric. Again, there are questions that have been asked, but not all the answers that, you know, I've wanted in, in my work thinking about other theories are out there. And this is certainly rigorously defined. Okay, well, of course, uh, there are rational conformal field theories where we can write down operator algebras in terms of katz moody algebras and the rest. And again, this is touching on topics I've spoken about, uh, you know, the paper I wrote a year ago and so forth. To what extent can you think of a conformal field theory as a sigma model, or perhaps a uh, you know, landa Ginsberg theory with a you know, target space and the potential, and then compare to the geometric, the analogous uh, geometric things. So in other words, quantum mechanics with that target space and potential. And you know, again, we've, we've focused very much on the differences, and there are, you know, that's in some ways the most important thing, but it's the similarities in a way that are equally striking, you know, that you can think of WZW models as strings on a group manifold, and you can basically think of the state spaces starting with uh, quantum mechanics, adding the string oscillators, and then reducing it by this uh, RG flow. And uh, not everything, but a good deal can be understood that way. And uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it's, it's a project I've been working on to try to ask the same questions for orbifolds and Gepner models that the C is the same in the large volume limit as in this uh, stringy regime. And uh, there has to be some map between the states of a sigma model with a Calabi L target in the large volume limit, in the small volume limit, on the orbifold, and so forth. And uh, again, one has this picture. You know, the, in the large volume limit, one has uh, <coughs> L0 plus L0 bar contains the Laplacian momentum states. It contains winding states contains oscillator states, and you can geometrically see where they come from. But, uh, <coughs> for example, there isn't actually any proper discussion of this uh, winding state contribution in the large volume. You know, these are very high dimension operators, but they're there. You know, and you know, what, what's the alpha prime correction to a winding state beyond the length? Well, nobody worked that out. And uh, if one can understand this formula, I, I have the suspicion that uh, you know, a Gepner model not only is a analytic continuation from a large volume Calabi yeah, but you'll be able to look at terms in this partition function and match them up in, 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 in some way. Yeah, but we don't even have the large volume thing to match them with yet. Okay, so uh, this is getting into this uh, question about uh, perturbation theory around other solvable theories now. So as suppose as you understood the Gepner model, there's this region around it in the moduli space of uh, superconformal field theories that you could access by perturbation theory. The uh, observables, we believe, are analytic in those coupling constants. So there's no reason that perturbation theory couldn't be convergent. You set up like the torus case, and it is convergent. You know, so, so why not? And uh, again, you know, this, this kind of basic foundational thing that was never worked out. So, so it would be nice to have. Okay, so let me let me briefly survey a few other things and then talk a bit about constructive theory and then end. So of course there's been you know important uh, developments in mathematics and uh, even you know two recent Diels medals for proving that particular 2D theories exist rigorously. So this is generally taking the attitude that you have a lattice definition like the 2D Eisen model or percolation, and of course that's a rigorous thing as it stands. 
just you'd like to take a limit of it or you know, show that certain quantities, you know, say, have a zero lattice spacing limit. And uh, very, very pretty you know, novel you know, concepts uh, show how to think about those things when they can be limit. You know, so this famous uh, schramm lubner evolution that describes various uh, contours, random contours that arise in these models. So this is a percolation boundary, the boundary around a percolating region. You can prove that it is a random curve of uh, SLE. Uh, Smirnoff has proven that a number of lattice theories are conformal in the limit without the brute force approach of computing all the correlation functions and taking their limits. He actually has a <coughs> you know, formalism that lets him say that, well, you know, here, here's the free fermion operator of the Ising model. And we, we've you know, known for, I don't know, you know, 60 years what it is. But does it become an actual conformal field theory fermion in the continuum limit? You know, is, it, is it really a holomorphic function on the world sheet with the specified cuts and so forth? And uh, so you can define a discrete holomorphic function on the lattice and set your definitions up so that the uh, Fermion, the, the lattice fermion is a discrete holomorphic function, which is not the same. You know, it doesn't obviously go over to a continuum holomorphic function, but it's certainly in the ballpark. And this, this facilitates getting the control over the theory to show that, well, yes, it does go over to a holomorphic function. So there's a lot, lot of interesting developments to learn from there. Uh, let me now talk about this uh, constructive theory. And uh, there, the basic observation you know, goes back to, uh, well, Dyson and the fact that standard perturbation theory you know, and the coupling constant around free theory is only asymptotic. You know, the uh, G loop grows as uh, G factorial, has zero radius of convergence. There's very good reasons. In fact, the, you know, the, the actual answers are not analytic at zero, except in some wedge. So that's inevitable in some sense. So you can't sum up the series. How do you, how do you work with a the theory? How do you know it exists? So that was the, that was the traditional problem of this constructive quantum field theory. And they came up with a solution, which is called the uh, cluster expansion. And that, I'll briefly explain the idea. So where the problem comes from is the large field regime. So uh, here's a zero dimensional integral over a single real variable phi for phi 4 theory. And it has an asymptotic expansion, just like uh, field theory. But uh, you know, there's something wrong here, because the integral the interaction term, which seems to be making the expansion so badly behaved, actually makes the integrand converge much better than the free theory. Well, just the problem is it, do, it does this if lambda is positive, and it doesn't do it if lambda is negative. So it's this non-analyticity that leads to the problem. And uh, then there's a kind of brute force way to fix it, which is to say that uh, suppose you cut up this uh, integral over you know, r into three pieces. You have some big number c. You got the middle, you got the ends. And you can easily check, you know, go home and do it, that uh, the integral bounded up and below by C, that series expansion, you get a conversion at series expansion. You know, because obviously, it, you know, the, the terms are bounded above by this e to the minus lambda C fourth thing. And uh, so that grows as a power of C. Phi to the 4n grows as C to the 4n. That's actually convergent. And then because you've got this e to the minus lambda phi 4, these other tails give this tiny correction, which goes away, and you finally take a limit. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a little brute force, but it certainly works. The problem is that uh, now you have to do it in field theory, and you have both uh, these uh, interaction terms at every point, but you have a kinetic term which couples neighboring points, and it's only simple in momentum space. And so now you've got two different things going on. And uh, so then what they do is they say, well, let's set up the usual perturbation expansion, you know, we know how to do that, we know how to renormalize, but now let's overlay on that some sort of a uh, decomposition of position space into a, a lattice in the sense that we, we, we've cut it up into, you know, some collection of hypercubes, you know, so the uh, cells of a uh, lattice. And then within each of those hypercubes, we're going to do this kind of decomposition of the uh, integration over the field. And so wherever we see the field getting large, we now apply this argument that says that, well, you know, actually the interaction is just totally killing that contribution. And uh, then this works, actually. This is the technique that was used to construct polynomial interactions in, in two dimensions, the 5-4 theory in, in, in three dimensions. So, so there's definitely 
you know, content, you know, in some sense they solve, you know, a, a problem of, of value to us. The, the problems with it are that it's, it's, it's a real mess, you know, this, this expansion. If you, if you get into the details, and you can kind of see from what you're doing that it, it, it is a mess. And it doesn't fit too well with gauge, you know, gauge symmetry you can, you can do by going back to the lattice and doing lattice gauge theory. Supersymmetry is, is, is hard to, you know, reconcile with this thing, but uh, actually not, not impossible. Okay, so there's a little bit more detail about this g equals 2 case. So this is the case where there is something to prove, but it's not a very hard thing to prove. So you have to normalize the interaction. You have to normal order. So you think about a lambda Ginsburg theory with just uh, some number of bosons and a potential. You know, in some sense, you have to normal order the interaction. And then the, the, the subtle problem is that if you actually think of this at finite cutoff epsilon as a function of phi, you, you can actually check that you know, these low order terms, they, they go as you know, log epsilon and log squared epsilon. And you get this tiny region of field space where the potential becomes arbitrarily negative because of these renormalization, you know, these subtractions. And so the potential is actually unbounded below. But it's unbounded below on this you know, very, very tiny piece of field space. And you can show that you know, the kinetic term and so forth keeps you out of there. And it gives you a finite theory. And so that, that was the content of, of, of this discussion. And uh, you know, again, just there's a variety of interesting things that were done in this way. Now, I, I think you can use this for supersymmetric theories, not in great generality, but in this, uh, form this lattice supersymmetry formulation of uh, Catterall, Kaplan, Unzel, and others, where basically you take the theories, supersymmetric gauge theories, you know, some, some others, where uh, you can twist the theory so that you no longer really have fermions. What you have is a dirac kahler fermions, which means differential forms on the lattice. Okay, so if you're in d dimensions, then of course if you list all the forms, they have two to d components, you know, the, the collection of all forms from zero up to d. And if you have that many fermions in your theory, then there will be a twisting for which the fermions, you know, combine, you know, you know embedding in the R symmetry and the, uh, you know, Lorentz Euclidean you know, symmetry become these forms. So you get the A twisted two comma two theory that's got four fermions in a multiplet. And you can actually get N equals four super Yang nulls that way. And then what you can do is you can exactly realize one nilpotent supercharge. Right? Of course, you can't get real supersymmetry on the lattice, but you can get a single nilpotent supercharge on the lattice. And so they were, they were kind of happy with this because at least it's something you can use to control the theory when you numerically simulate it. And of course, we can be even happier with this because uh, after you know, in, you know, initial part of the discussion, we rapidly choose one nilpotent supercharge and tend to concentrate very much on that topological sector of the theory. And this is saying that some of those theories really can be embedded in lattice theories that should be constructible, this two-dimensional case constructible, more or less using the techniques already developed by uh, Glenn and Jaffe and others. So, so, so that problem of justifying localization that I started with really doesn't seem like a crazy problem to work on. It seems like the ingredients are there. I was looking at this with uh, A.J. Tolland, one of our postdocs, and we, we got a certain distance, but it turns out that there's this, this subtle point that we eventually realized that, that stopped us, or at least makes to, you know, it means that you do need something new. So, so what you can try to do is you can take the A model and do these uh, instanton calculations of a gauge linear sigma model where you integrate over vortex, vortex moduli spaces. So some of you will know this. I think. Uh, Sheldon's talk referred to a bit of this. There's, uh, say, U1 gauge theory. There's, uh, you know, chiral supermultiple Z, and then there's some, you know, potential in a defining function, you know, P of Z equals zero. And the instanton is a holomorphic map from the world sheet into Z, satisfying this nonlinear equation P of Z equals zero. And then it turns out it's, it's exactly the same discrete holomorphic function that uh, Smirnoff was uh, using. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's not a new concept, and quite a bit is known about it. And one of the things that's known is that when you multiply two discrete holomorphic functions, it's not discrete holomorphic anymore. Okay, so it's got this little, you know, bell bar, non-zero piece. And so this now becomes a hard equation to solve. You can't just multiply, you know, z, z equals, you know, little z and so forth. And uh, that's kind of as, as far as we got. And then there are reasons, actually, if you know about this stuff, you know, it shouldn't, you know, the instant time moduli space has these subtleties, and it shouldn't have been too easy to do this. But you know, we have ideas how to how to proceed at this point. In any case, you can you can you can, you can certainly set up the, the problem that I discussed. 
OK, so, so let me just make a couple more words of comment. OK, so you know, so much you know, effort you know, to, to make these constructions work to get a convergent expansion. But again, it's a problem which is intrinsic to the situation. You know, we coupling perturbation theory, there, 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 there's really even physical reasons why the uh, loop orders grow factorially. And even if you totally reorganize the perturbation theory, say you know, our mm -hmm. friends who work on n equals 4 gauge theory find this incredibly simple twister formulation, which allows you to write down every amplitude in a few lines to all loop orders, well, I bet they will still grow as, uh, to, you know, as, as L factorial at L loops, right? Because it, it's physics that makes them do that, not, not some sort of deficiency of Feynman diagrams. And so then they will face this problem. And uh, so it's, 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 it's a problem worth uh, thinking about at uh, this point. And uh, I think the, the if, I, if, you know, a little presumptuous, but the, what, what I, again, I, I think this cluster expansion, it, it, it works, and the main criticism you can make of it is kind of ugly and complicated. And on the other hand, the idea in itself was, was fairly natural, is to say there really is this large field region where the fields become large, and we just have to treat that differently than the small field region. And, uh, well, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a mess, but uh, so was perturbative normalization when people first started working on it. You know, there's this large momentum region and the order one and small momentum region, and you just have to treat them differently, and you have to do special things to isolate the contributions of the large momentum region and use them to renormalize the uh, couplings and so forth. And so the fact that uh, people worked on this problem for 50 years and cleaned it all up and found the beautiful structure in it is why we can be relatively happy with this. And uh, trying to now either make this type of decomposition of configuration space or something else that has the same effect in a more geometric way, in a way that allows at least, you know, if you have messy choices to make, you at least like a formalism that makes that relatively simple to, to work with. You know, you've isolated the messy choice. If you change the messy choice, that's some sort of natural covariance or homotopy of your formulation. And so it may be that this is really a valid way to go, but it just has not received the sort of technical and, and mathematical attention that it should, and it could be made prettier if one did that. So, uh, so I'll stop uh, there. Thank you.